<clears throat> now we're going to move on to external financing needed. Also known as long-term financial planning. By the way, accounting and finance, what do we mean by long-term? Anything more than a year into the future. And so, uh, they, you know, they're, it sounds like from here to the end of time, um, but for, for what we're going to talk about here, I'll only demonstrate planning one year into the future. By the way, does the environment change over time, the, 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 your industry's environment? Yeah. Uh, do you think the prices of your inputs change over time? Yeah. Do you think the demand for different products changes over time? Yeah. And so, you know, it's nice to think that we can plan 30 years into the future, but you really, it is very difficult to do that. And so we're just going to talk about one year into the future. Now, let's talk about when financial planning happens. You might think, uh, as a finance guy, that I think finance should run the show. But in truth, finance bats cleanup in this whole operation. So here's the strategic plan. So first of all, managers must make decisions about what future products and service directions the firm needs to take. So I'll give you some examples. When I worked in plastics, we had our annual meeting to discuss this. It's an annual strategic planning meeting. And we would have our marketing people who've been doing surveys come in and tell us what's hot and what's not. And in the one that I sat in on, we had uh, the marketing guy come in from automotive he says suvs are really taken off at the time suvs were primarily made in the u.s and we were a supplier to the people who made the dashboards and the, the door pieces all that plastic stuff inside and so we knew that we were going to need to gear up for additional production of plastics for suvs we also knew that there was a new study that came out that told us that these phthalates, let's talk about PVC. PVC is polyvinyl chloride. You probably recognize the white pipes, white plastic pipes that carries your sewage away. Thankfully, we all enjoy PVC, right? Here's the problem with PVC, it's very brittle. And so you've got to use these things called plasticizers to make it easy enough to work with. So we put something called phthalate in there to make it um, pliable enough to work it with. And in fact, we made, uh, we as a human race, not me personally, we would make water bottles like the one that's sitting there in front of Mr. Stratman. Uh, we would make those out of PVC. Now here's the problem. Phthalate turns out to be an estrogen mimic. What is estrogen? Most of you should have some experience with it. It's a female hormone. Hey, even males have a certain amount of estrogen in them. Did you guys know that? And women have a certain amount of testosterone in them. That's just the way nature works. Kind of free. Now, back to the story. Here's the problem. When you introduce additional estrogen into men, they start to develop breasts. Do you think, and I'm not saying everybody, but do you think that most men would find that objectionable? Mr. Mr. Poem says no. <laughs> I would. I would. It's, it's hard enough at my age to try not to grow them naturally, right? Okay, now we're getting way off in the weeds. Back to the story. So what did that mean? It meant the market for PVC for anything other than pipes that were going to carry your sewage away and for the siding on the side of your house basically was going to dry up. Now the good news is we could take the machinery we were using to make these PVC products and we could turn it around and use it to make these automotive products. But in order to know that, we have to, oh, let's see, where are we Okay, so we already talked about this. No, no, okay, so I'm going to go back a little bit. So marketing, we, we talked about there identifying the uh, market growth there with the uh, existing products. 
are going to go up and there's also potential markets for new products and so there may be a product that you haven't created yet but these marketing people will say hey you know what would be a really killer thing to do it, what if we could have a smartphone that you could roll up to the size of a cheap cigar and stick in your pocket wouldn't that be cool would you, would you guys pay good money for that I mean when you sit on it are you going to break it no right and it's thin and it's all good so it sounds like a great idea now marketing people are not constrained by reality I don't know if we, yeah we have an, we have a marketing person here she understands okay so now who has to come in next well that's engineering engineering has to come in and talk about the technical feasibility of these new products for instance with my example about the automotive products and the PVC products it had to be our engineering folks that said oh yeah our equipment can switch from making this to making that and tell us what would need to be done in order to make that happen also there is the design of the product itself if you came to me as an engineer and you said oh hey I want to make a phone that rolls up here's a, what I would tell you yes we do have the technology but it's in an early stage and if we jumped into this market first of all the product that we're going to sell is going to be suboptimal and it's going to give us a bad reputation and secondly each one that we make is going to be hyper expensive do you guys remember that first samsung foldable phone and it had that plastic sheet that you thought was a green protector but you tear it off and then the thing stops working what did that do to Samsung's reputation oh I trashed it right okay so the point is engineering here is given this is giving technical feasibility now here's the problem though engineers really don't think in terms of costs we think in terms of wouldn't that be cool and you guys have the money right <laughs> I used to love doing engineering projects with other people's money because you dream big, baby, right? Okay, now, that's where accounting and procurement come in. And they say, well, yeah, engineering says we could do that, but the stuff that they're trying to produce this out of is an element called unobtainium, and it costs a million dollars an ounce. There's no way we're going to be able to do that at a profit. By the way, what is procurement? Yeah, buying. So back in the old days, we would have called this the purchasing department. We would have called human resources the personnel department. But now we have procurement and human resources. Right? Sounds so much better. Basically, they're going out there and buying stuff. So they know the cost per ounce for this unobtainium the engineers want to use. Okay, now, after all this information comes in, managers have to decide on which new products to introduce and which existing projects should have their production levels raised or lowered in the case of the PVC. Now, do you think managers have perfect information about the future? No. In fact, if you can predict the future with certainty, come to my office. We'll get rich together. Right? So, managers are in the same boat. We're investing under risk here. And so they're going to go with their best best guess based on what they've been told. Now, I will tell you this about marketing people. I know we have two marketing people in here. Uh, I'm going to say, ask you both, are you optimists or pessimists? Optimist. Optimist. And you are? Yeah. Yeah, she says. She's, she hopes to be an optimist. <laughs> what does that mean about the sales numbers, the projected sales numbers we get from marketing people? Okay. Yeah, they're probably too high. And so anytime a marketing, and it was funny because my marketing guy, he was predictably optimistic, meaning he was almost always off by the same amount. And so all I would do is take his number and multiply it by 0.8. And then I have my number. And it worked out beautifully. I never told him it would have broke his heart. But keep these things in mind when you do your predictions. Okay, now that we've decided what we're going to, uh, new products we're going to introduce, what we're, uh, we're going to increase production of, and what we're going to decrease production of. If we're overall looking at increased sales, we might require increased assets, especially if the company is running at full 
capacity. Let's talk about what full capacity means. I couldn't produce another single unit of the things that we're doing here with the current assets that I have. In other words, I need to go build a new factory. So, example, Tesla. When they first, uh, they got, they had that factory in Fremont, California, and they had it totally uh, filled with the production of the Model S. When they go to introduce the Model 3, what did they have to do? Yeah, and what did they build it in? They put a tent next to their old factory. And so the first Model 3s were built in a tent, and you can tell. Now, that's what we're talking about, full capacity. And they've hit full capacity multiple times again since then, because what are they doing? They built a factory in China. They've built one, or they're building one in uh, Berlin, Germany. They're building one down in Texas. And that's what happens when you get to full capacity. Now, Elon Musk is looking at his projections in his strategic plan and saying, wow, we need to have additional factories in order to make those cars. And so that means additional assets. Does that make sense? Okay, so we've got the strategic plan now, and now we are finally to the financial plan. And so the financial plan is all about figuring out how we're going to pay for these new assets. How we're going to pay for these new assets. So there are three ways, three places we can get the money. Number one, we can use what is called internal equity. Internal equity comes from when we earn money, but we have not yet distributed it to the shareholders. And so, uh, and I don't think Tesla pays dividends yet, do they? I don't think they do. Uh, so they could use all of their net income, basically, as money to fund this asset growth. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, they could also sell additional shares. That's called external equity. They could also sell additional shares. That's called external equity. And then the final way is called debt. And uh, it's all debt is external. If you work for a conglomerate, for instance, anyone here work for SRC here in town? You do? Oh, okay. So SRC, it, do, do, is this just one company that does the same thing? They have like Oh yeah, they've got a boatload of divisions. Now, here's the way it works at SRC. When they make a profit, uh, of course it goes to the mothership, which is SRC Holdings. And then when people want to borrow money to do an expansion at their particular facility in their division, they can actually borrow it from the corporate headquarters. But is that truly internal debt? The answer is no, it's actually internal equity because it's money that uh, either came from their own operation or that came from profitable other divisions, right? If SRC goes out and borrows money on the market through issuing bonds, then that would also be external debt. So even if you work at one of these conglomerates where you can borrow from the mothership, don't believe that it's internal debt because there is no such thing. Okay, questions? Let's talk about the signals that these different things send. If I'm able to pay for my new assets with internal equity alone, is that good news or bad news? Let's say this conversation. You're telling your folks you're going to buy a new car. And your folks say, are you going to need any help buying that? You say, of course you'll say yes. <laughs> and the answer should be, no, I've, I've got money, I'm going to write a check for it. Is that good news or bad news to your folks? Yeah, it's good news, right? The second best piece of good news would be, no, I don't need help because I've got this great deal on a loan, and I'm going to be taking care of that. That's the second best piece of news. The, the, the worst one up here is external equity, and here's why. 
Do people like to share good things? No. You got a you got a great piece of pie there, and your girlfriend, your boyfriend comes up and says, "Hey, wow, that looks great. Can I split that with you?" What do you immediately think? Oh, come on, be real. No, I may love this person, but I want this pie all to myself. Does that make sense? So, if you thought you were on to a good deal, would you want to sell part of that good deal to someone else? No. And so this external equity actually sends a negative um, signal to the market. What we see is when a company issues uh, debt, that there's really no reaction in the stock market to the issuance of debt. But if a company issues additional shares, the share price goes down. It's perceived as bad news for the firm. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> So most of the stuff in finance, when we get around to doing the numbers, we have <laughs> equations. And you may find things that claim to be equations for the stuff that we're getting ready to do here, but it's actually more of a process. So here's the process. Number one, start with sales growth from the strategic plan. By the way, this is an excellent exam question. Where, what's the first, what's the raw ingredient for a strategic plan? What's the first thing you need for a strategic plan? And the answer is always, sales growth. The second thing is that we're going to assume our assets are currently at full capacity. Now, we're going to relax that assumption later, but for now we're just going to assume we're at full capacity, which means if we're going to grow any, we've got to buy more assets. Now, the third thing is we're going to assume that assets grow at the same rate as sales. Now, this can also be a bit of a lame assumption. Here's why. If I am currently running at 100% in a factory and I need 20% more, am I going to go out and build 20% of another factory? No, I got to go out and build another factory, right? And so this one is an assumption you got to keep your eye on. We're going to then determine the addition to retain earnings in the new scenario. Why are we going to do that? Well, if you think back, to where we get additional retained earnings from, it's net income minus any dividends that we pay, that's left over as addition to retained earnings. And it gets added to the accumulated retained earnings on the balance sheet. Can anyone tell me if that's an asset, liability, or owner's equity, the accumulated retained earnings? guys need to review, to review chapter two. It's in the owner's equity. It's in the owner's equity. That's undistributed profits and it belongs to the shareholders, the common shareholders. And so that's why we're concerned about this addition to retained earnings because that is the incremental increase in our internal equity that we can use to fund these new assets. So then after we figure out that, anything else over and above that is external financing needed, EFN, external financing needed. And we're going to look at that increase in assets minus the addition to retained earnings because that's the extra money we need to go out and raise. Now here gets the tricky part. We need to decide whether that EFN should be raised as a debt equity or a mixture of both. And as we work through here, you'll see how different assumptions lead us to different conclusions using even the same numbers. Are there any questions so far? Okay, take a deep breath because we're getting ready to dive in here. So here, oh by the way, things say, this stuff is so complicated. Let me let you in on a very interesting secret here. This is very simplified compared to what you actually would do in the real world. Because what you would actually do is go through the entire balance sheet and you would ask, is this asset going to have to increase as a result of the increased sales? And if it is, then you have to make an assumption about what percentage is going to have to go up. And so like we said about the plant property and equipment, 
If we have to build another entire factory, we have to take care of that. And then there will be some things, like inventory, that may only go up the same percentage of sales. In fact, we would hope that it would only go up the same percentage of sales. And so you have to go through every single account on your balance sheet and figure out these things to figure out what your true increase in the assets is. So be thankful that we have a very simplistic balance sheet here that we're dealing with and income statement. OK. so. Uh, here's where we're starting out. Our sales are currently 1,000. Our costs are 800. And that net income of 200 gets divided evenly between dividends and addition to retained earnings. Now, how did I know how much addition to retained earnings would be? I simply take net income and I subtract the dividends. What's left over is addition to retained earnings. Remember, common shareholders are residual claimants, and so what's left over goes to the common shareholders, and that's the addition to retained earnings. Okay, now over here on the balance sheet, we see that we have 500 in assets, and that that is uh, funded with 250 in each of debt and equity. Now, it's a balance sheet, so the total of debt and equity have to equal the total of the assets. Does that make sense? Always has to be. Otherwise, it's not a balance sheet. It's an unbalanced sheet. We don't want any unbalanced sheets. What is the forecast of sale growth for next year? Remember, it's or we were being told it's 20%. And remember, that is the very first thing we need before we start this whole financial planning process. So that's a key piece of information right there. So now we're going to go through. We, we've been given no information about the dividend policy, but we have been told we need to grow while maintaining a constant debt-to-equity ratio. What's our current debt-to-equity ratio? Yeah, it's one, right? So it's 250 over 250, so it gives us one. Okay, so when we get done here, debt and equity better be the same number or else we will not have the same debt to equity ratio. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so what we're going to start to do is increase things in the income statement by the percentage of sales increase. So the first one's really easy to understand, and that is we've got 1,000, and we know sales are going to grow by 20%, and so we're up to 1,200. The next one's a little more iffy, because costs actually come in two flavors. What kinds of costs? I'll, I'll give you a hint. One of them's called variable costs, and that flows directly. That goes up and down directly with the amount we produce. What's the other kind called? Fixed yeah, fixed costs. And so my guess is that these costs actually won't go up by 20%. Does that make sense? But we're not given enough information to do anything else here. And so our assumption will be that all costs grow at the same rate as sales. And so we can then find our net income either by multiplying by the growth in sales by the way, why am I multiplying by 1.2? 20% is actually 0.2. If I want to find out what 120% of the previous number was, it's multiplied by 1.2. Does that make sense? OK. And so that means our net income is 240. Now, we have not been given any information at all about how much in dividends that we're going to be paying. And so it turns out that we're actually going to have to kind of work our way backwards, but we'll get to that here in a minute. Now, the other, another assumption that we made is that our assets need to grow at the same rate as sales. And we know that sales are growing at 20%, so we're going to multiply our assets by that same 1.2. And it takes us from 500 up to 600. But now we've got a problem. Can anyone identify the problem on the balance sheet? It's not balanced. It's not balanced. And so we need to take that information to our next step. And we are going to now say that, well, hey, apparently debt and equity have to add to that same amount. And that's what we'll do. Now, there's a couple of ways to go about this. You could say in your head, aha, uh -huh, these things are going to have to uh, be equal to each other 
and when you add them together, that equals 600. So it's really easy to figure out. It should be 300 and 300. The other way you could go about it is knowing that they're both going to increase by 20%, multiply by 1.2, and that gets you up to the 300 and 300. So there's more than one way to do this. Question so far. Okay, now here's the issue. We used to have 250 in debt, now we've got 300. We used to have 250 in equity, now we've got 300. We need to figure out where we're going to get that extra 50 for each of those. And we know that we can use internal equity, which is preferred, right? And so uh, we know that our addition to retained earnings needs to be 300 minus 250. And so that means our addition to retained earnings must be 50. What does that mean for dividends? Well, we know that addition to retained earnings plus dividends must equal the net income. So net income minus addition to retained earnings gives us the dividends. In this case, dividends are the plug variable. That's the number that we let float to make all the math come out correctly. Is it important to know which one the plug variable is going to be when you start down the path? Absolutely not. But you do know one of these things has to float because you can't constrain everything. One of them has to float. Okay. Well, now we know we're getting that 50 internally. We know we're paying out 190 in dividends. And so how much is the actual external financing needed here? We're getting all that 50, we're getting the 50 in equity inside, but where does the 50 in debt have to come from? Remember, is there any internal debt? No, there is no such thing as internal debt. So that has to be external, and therefore we know our external financing needed is 50. And what kind of external financing is it? It's debt financing. Now, do you see why I think of this more as a process than as a formula? you got to walk through it step by step by step. Does that make sense? Okay, now they're telling us to grow while paying out no dividend. Well, if we're paying out no dividend, our addition to retained earnings will, of course, be 240. And that 240, we said, is going to get added on to the equity over there. The equity would, therefore, be 490. Our new assets are still 600. What's 600 minus 490? 110, right? And so that means our new equity, our new debt amount, has to be 110. If you owe a friend $250 and you want to get down to only owing them $110, what must you do? Pay them. How much? What was the numbers again? Uh, 250 and 110. We're trying to get from 250 down to 110. You guys can't do that math in your head. We are doomed as a people. 140, very good. There's a glimmer of hope. Okay. Yeah, 140. We got to pay off 140 in debt. Now, here's the trick. If I'm borrowing money, that's positive external financing net needed. If I'm paying off debt, what would that be? Money's going the other way. It's negative, right? And so the external financing needed here is actually negative 140. Negative 140. Now, sometimes students say, well, wait a minute. Um, what if we left that? Well, I'll leave that. We'll, we'll come back to that, sorry. Now they're being, we're being told to grow while we'll maintaining a constant dividend payout ratio. So let's talk about what the dividend payout ratio is. It's just dividends divided by net income. And it ranges from zero to one, or should. But here's the trick. You could actually pay more dividends than you have in net income. What would happen to your addition to retained earnings then? Would actually go, or your, your addition to retained earnings would be negative if your accumulated retained earnings would go down. So we're just going to say this right here, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, what is our dividend payout ratio here?
what's 100 and divide it by 200. Yeah, very good, one half. And so we've got a dividend payout ratio of 0.5. Now, if I apply that same 0.5 to my current or my new net income of 240, I see that I'm going to have to pay 120 in dividends, and I'm going to have to I'm going to have 120 in addition to retained earnings. Does that make sense? Okay. And so we're going to play the same game that we did before, where we know now that we've got that 120 that has to be added to the 250 of equity that brings us up to 370. How do I find out how much debt I have? I have to take 600 minus the 370 in equity and that leaves me with how much debt? What is 600 minus 370? 230, very good, 230. We started at 250, and we're trying to get to 230, so that means we need to pay down 20 in debt. And so for this example, the external financing needed is minus 20. Now, you notice the last one was minus 140, this one's minus 20. What's the difference between the two? The difference is in these constraints that we're being put on. We're being told to, here to grow while maintaining a constant dividend payout ratio, there we were being told to do a dividend payout ratio of zero. It's the assumptions that you make that are going to change these numbers using the same example. Okay, now sometimes students say, wait a minute, what if we don't pay down that 20 in debt? What happens? Well, then your assets are going to be equal to 620. Your debt plus equity is equal to 620. What does that mean for your assets? They've also got to be equal to 620. Now, what's going to happen there is you're going to wind up with an extra 20 in cash on the balance sheet. It's more cash than you need. Is that what our shareholders want? No. Shareholders don't want us sitting around on a fat checkbook that we don't need. And so this is why we would say, look, we've got to, we've got to pay that money out, and it's obvious we need to use it to pay down the debt questions. Okay, now we're getting fancy. We're going to pay a set dividend while maintaining a constant debt to equity ratio. And so we're told that we're going to be paying set dividends of 200. If my net income is 240 and my dividends are 200, what does that mean? My addition to retained earnings has to be it's got to be 40, 240 minus 200. Okay, now that means we've got a little bit of a problem though, because we're told we need to maintain a debt to equity ratio of one, which we had previously. And we know from a previous example that that means debt and equity have to be equal to 300 each, right? But if I add 40 to the initial 250, what is 250 plus 40? Yeah, it gives me 290. We're 10 short. And so in this case, we're going to have to raise two kinds of external uh, financing. First of all, we need 10 in equity. We're going to issue 10 worth of stock. And then we're going to go out and borrow that extra 50 that we need for the debt. And so if I ask you what is the total external financing needed, it would be the 10 plus the 50 or 60. Once again, it's a process. And the reason the formulas really don't work is because the assumptions change how you do the process. Now what if your current sales are less than full capacity? Well, let's say that we're at 90% full capacity and we don't mind being at full capacity after we have our new production in place. Let me tell you, first of all, why that's a bad idea in the real world. If I'm running 100% all the time, and then someone makes a mistake, and I have to remake something, am I ever going to get caught up? No. Number two, I'm running at full capacity, and then a sweet, juicy, tempting order comes in. Can I accept it? No. 
especially if it's like one that they've got to have right now. So when I was running my own business back in 97, 98, 99, I would run at maybe 80, 90% capacity because my guys messed up all the time, right? We had to have the ability to remake stuff in case someone screwed something up. And the second reason was I would occasionally get the opportunity to fulfill a very hot order and I could price that thing amazingly high. Now, don't, don't, we're not talking about stealing from people here. Let me explain what we're talking about. We were making valves for the offshore oil industry. And you had to have the valve in order to move on with the process. The rig that was sitting over that well cost a quarter million dollars a day to rent. And this is 1997 money, so it's more than that now. Now, you've got not only the rig rental, you've got the salaries of all the people that are on board. You've got to feed those people. You've got to take away their waste. You've got to do all sorts of things. It's very expensive to have an offshore rig. And so every day that that rig was sitting out there, unoccupied, or uh, uh, not busy, was basically costing them an extra quarter million plus. And so if I could get them a, a valve, say eight days early, that's $2 million at least of value for the customer. Let's say the sticker price for the valve was 100000 Do you think I could sell it to them for 300000 Oh yeah, that's a bargain for them, right? Does that make sense? And so we're both better off. But if I don't, if I'm running at full capacity, can I take that sweet hot order? No, I can't. I can't do it without making every other thing late for the rest of all time. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm going to tell you how to do this, but I'm not advising that you do it. So what are we going to do? Well, first of all, is we need to figure out uh, what is our fraction of the full capacity we're currently using, and. Um, we know we're running at 90%, we're told that, so that's a fraction. And then we, uh, our sales are what we're told. So to find your full capacity, what we have to do is take our current sales divided by our current utilization. And when we do that, we come up with 1,111.1111, it just goes on forever, right? So next we're gonna find the percentage of increase of the new sales level over full capacity. Because we're going to, so there's this portion of capacity that we're gonna be able to take up to get up to 100%, but then what we're asking for in sales growth is actually gonna shoot us beyond that. So we need 1,200. We're gonna subtract full capacity and then divide by full capacity. So it's an 8% increase over full capacity. So what does that mean for my assets? Instead of needing 600, I only need 540 because 500 times 1.08 is 540. And so it just adds another step into the process, but the remaining steps are the same as before. Now, what if you are wanting to maintain the same level of capacity? So I told you I wanted to stay at around 80%. I would treat it mathematically, it's identical to if I am at full capacity. And so basically it would be back to the simpler examples that we worked at the beginning. So if you want to keep your, your full capacity, if you want to keep your capacity at the same level, your utilization at the same level, don't worry about this. It's only when you want to try to use up that unused capacity that you have to do this fancy little calculation. Oh, okay, so I already talked about this, but there's one thing I didn't mention, and that is recovering for breakdowns. Um, I'm gonna ask Mr. Kunkel, since you were at SRC, did you guys ever have machinery that broke down? Yeah. Oh yeah, is, is that a good thing? What? Is that a good thing? No. no. And so picture a, pub, a production process like this. You've got station one, you've got station two, you've got station three, four, and five. Now, what happens if there's a breakdown at station number three? Station four and five can continue running for a short while until the, the work that was stacked at their stations is gone, but now they're idle. 
stations one and two, when, as soon as I hear that workstation number three is down, first thing I would do is run out and tell one and two to stop. Why? What's going to happen if they keep producing? Yeah, build up. yeah it's going to stack up. And you'll have, first of all, it creates a dangerous situation because you're running out of floor space and you've got pallets stacked high and things fall on people, people die. That's a severe example, but it happens. And the second thing is we're putting, we're, we're creating basically work in process inventory that we don't actually need. And so that's the first thing I do is shut down one and two. Well, now I got my, uh, my maintenance guy and I'm like, how long before this machine comes back? And, and you know, if it's a day or two, I'm in a world of hurt if I'm running at 100%. Because it's going to put every order until the end of time a day or two late. Unless I choose to just tell the very next guy in line, hey pal, you're never going to get your order. Do you think that's good business? No. Okay, so these are all good reasons to keep some slack capacity. Are there any questions? By the way, do you think manufacturing is the only place where you've got capacity issues? No, think about a customer, a call center. Any of you try to call an airline lately? Do you think they have a capacity issue? Because you're on the phone for like 17 hours and then they answer and they tell you to basically uh, so I can't think of anything kind to say here. <laughs> they tell you to get lost, right? Uh, I think they've got a capacity issue. And so even if you're in a service industry, oh, by the way, also, when you walk into a restaurant and they say, oh, you're going to have to wait to be seated, and they're like, there's only four tables currently occupied. And what do they say? There's, there's only one server, right? And so you even in a service industry, you have to think about capacity and just keeping some slack capacity. Because what if a, 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 a what's it called, a hen party or a bachelor party, what if they all show up and want to have dinner at your place? Right? Wouldn't you want some slack capacity to take care of that? Okay. So let's talk about the summary for this deal. First of all, we're going to forecast the sales growth. That's the first step. We're going to increase the sales and costs by the same proportion. Of course, that assumes that our profit margin stay, it's going to, the outcome of that is going to be that our profit margin remains constant. Uh, the assumption is that our costs are all variable costs, which may or may not be true. Um, we're going to look at our current computer, uh, cap capacity utilization and our constraints like our dividend payout policy and our capital structure policy. We're going to determine how much of our new equity comes from addition to retained earnings using the net income and whatever dividend constraints we've been given. We're going to add that ARE to, um, oh, I'm skipping a step here. We're going to inflate the assets by the same percentage of sales. And then we're going to add that ARE to the equity. And then we're going to have to figure out what that's going to do with debt, uh, whether we're going to have to pay off some debt or borrow new debt. Uh, we're going to figure out whether we have to issue external equity if addition to retained earnings by itself was not enough to get us to our new level of equity. And basically, we're using this capital structure constraints to figure out uh, whether that external financing needing needed is debt or equity. Questions? OK. We will pick up and we will do this last little bit of chapter three next time, but be sure to bring your balance sheet, income statement slides, and also your chapter four slides, specifically the one with the special cash flow streams, and we'll try to do a review on that material to get you ready for the exam. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Then we can have a talk. By the way, afterwards, if you want to talk about your exam, um, you can come to my office and I'll print it out and I will work off, I'll work out the problems you miss and we'll talk about it. Any questions? Okay, so back to this, EFN and growth. EFN stands for external financing needed and we tend to talk about two growth rates and by the way we're talking about the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm. We're talking about the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm. 
the internal growth rate, which is also known as IGR, tells us how fast the company can grow on internal equity alone. Where does internal equity come from? It's the addition to retain earnings. Where does addition to retain earnings come from? It's what's left over after you pay your, it's what's left of net income after you pay the dividends. And so we're just looking at net income minus dividends. That's our addition to retained earnings. Okay. So that means we are not doing any external financing whatsoever, which means, of course, that we're not using any debt. Now, if you grow your company in this way and you're not 100% equity to begin with, what this means is over time, your amount of debt in your capital structure is going to go down, down, down. The sustainable growth rate, however, says that's how fast you can grow a company on internal equity and the right amount of debt to keep your debt to equity ratio uh, the same over time. Now, what we see is based on different industries, there is what we think is an ideal capital structure for each one. For example, if you look at tech firms, typically they have 0% debt. And that's because, uh, especially, let's talk biotech. The, the business model of biotech is to invest a lot of money and you basically lose money, lose money, lose money, lose money, find a cure for AIDS, whoop, huge payoff, right? Could those people be making debt payments along the way? No, they don't have the cash flow for it. So those firms are typically all equity. However, the more stable your cash flows are, the more debt you want in your capital structure because interest on debt is tax deductible and the dividends that you pay to your shareholders are not. And so there's a tax benefit to having debt. Let me ask you this question. Would you loan money to a company that had 90% debt and only 10% equity in their capital structure? Now, most people would say no. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Do you have a checking account? Yeah. You are loaning money to a company that only has 10% equity in their capital structure. Banks typically run on 90% debt. You know, the deposits and things and CDs, things that people have given them the money to hold on to. So it's basically like a loan to the bank. And the actual owner's equity is only around 10%. Now, why is this okay? Because the cash flows that are coming in at the bank are typically so smooth that they don't have to worry about um, this issue of being caught short of cash to pay. Does that make sense? Okay, now, should you run your own business if you're not a bank at 90% debt? Absolutely not. Okay, so the sustainable growth rate says this. If your debt to equity ratio is currently one, for every dollar of internal equity that we develop, we can go out and borrow one dollar of debt. Now keep in mind that if we were doing this through the internal growth rate way, we could only increase the assets by one dollar for that same dollar of internal equity. But if we're doing it the sustainable growth rate way and the debt to equity ratio is one, that means that we can also add a dollar of debt. So we could grow the assets $2. And so in this example, we can grow the uh, assets twice as fast using the sustainable growth rate as we will with the internal growth rate. The sustainable growth rate will always be equal to or greater than the internal growth rate. And the reason is this. Any, if you have two firms, or if you've got one firm and it has no equity, it only has equity, no debt whatsoever, then these two will be identical because they're the additional debt to keep it at the same amount is zero, right? To keep it the same proportion. But if you have, as, as the debt starts to rise, the distance between these two gets higher and higher and sustainable growth rate rises away from the internal growth rate. So let's look at some formulas here and see what we're talking about. First of all, we said internal growth rate is IGR. What does ROA mean? Yeah, it's return on assets. Now, one you may not be as familiar with is B. What is B? Oh, you're getting close. 
Okay, so it's actually the plowback ratio or the retention ratio. And so what it is, is addition to retained earnings divided by net income. It's also equal to one minus the dividend payout ratio. Because after all, addition retained earnings plus dividends equal to net income. Now, you got to be careful when you're working these problems because I might give you the plowback ratio, also known as the retention ratio. But I might give you the dividend payout ratio. If I give you the dividend payout ratio, it's just a simple matter of saying one minus that thing to get B. But every finance problem requires you to read before you start doing math. And so the, you're reading here to see what has he given me, right? Okay, the other uh, tip that I'll give you about working these finance problems is always go down and read what the question is first and know what you're looking for. That way you know what you need to get there. Because I may actually give you additional information in the problem that you don't need. And if you start working from the beginning of the problem, you don't read the question first, you may be trying to figure out what to do with these pieces of junk that I've thrown in there. And you say, why would you be so cruel as to give us information we don't need? In the real world, we end up having less information than we need. If I did that, you guys would show up at my office door with pitchforks and torches, right? So the closest simulation I can do for that is to give you extra information you don't need and see if you're wise enough to just ignore it. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so let's see. Uh, here what we have, we have ROA times B on the top, and we have that same thing on the bottom. So when I'm working a problem like this, what I will do is I will start out with ROA times B, and I will store that in my calculator. Do you guys know how to use the store function on your calculator? Probably not. Okay, so I'm going to get up the calculator here and we'll just show that. Okay, so let's assume that ROA is 10% and B is 0.5. And so I'm going to say 0.1 times 0.5. And that's going to be 0 0.05. What I would do at this point is hit STO, which is short for what? Store. And then 1. Here's the cool thing about the TIBA 2 Plus. You've got 10 different drawers you can hide numbers in. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Those are your 10 drawers. I just hid this number in drawer number 1. Now, how could I get that number back? Any ideas? Recall, and then what? Oh, well, there you go. Okay, so here we go. I've recalled it. I'm going to divide by open parentheses, 1 minus, recall, 1, close parentheses, equal. Now, if you'll notice, this number comes out being fairly close to ROA times B. So that's a way to check your work. If your number doesn't come out to be fairly close to ROA times B, then go back and check your work. Does that make sense? By the way, whenever you're doing math with percentages in, in an equation like this, always go with decimals. There will be some occasions upon which we could actually use a percentage but it takes some experience to figure out what those are. You can never go wrong with the decimals as long as you remember to convert them back to percentages when you're done. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's take a look at the sustainable growth rate, SGR. Can anybody tell me what the only difference between these two is? Say again. Yeah, it's ROE, return on equity, instead of ROA. And so what we had previously, we have ROA is net income over total assets. ROE 
is actually ROA times the equity multiplier. That's the equity multiplier right there. And if we remember, this is basically one plus the debt to equity ratio. So what does this mean? If the debt to equity ratio is zero, meaning the firm has no debt whatsoever, the relationship between ROA, sorry about that, <laughs> ROE and ROA, they're, they're exactly the same, right? But as we put a little bit more debt in here, you're gonna to start to see ROE climb away. And this is why we see sustainable growth rate climb away as our debt to equity ratio increases. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk about what impacts these two rates. First of all, we've got profit margin. How does profit margin impact these? Well, you notice there's net income in both of these. Net income is profit margin times sales. Does that make sense? And total asset turnover is going to in, is going to hit both of these too, and that is total assets over sales. So if you remember the beginning of the so the um, Dupont identity is R O E is equal to profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier. R O A is just the first two parts of those. So profit margin and total asset turnover are going to both impact, are going to impact both these measures. Now, can anybody tell me what the formula for total asset turnover is? Um, how about sales over total assets? There you go. This is sales over total assets and profit margin is net income over sales. And so we see the sales cancel out. Sure enough, we've got ROA. So that's why it affects profit margin and total asset turnover affects both. Also, the dividend policy affects both. Which of the variables up here would actually be impacted by your dividend? By the way, dividend policy is deciding how much of this net income that we're earning that we want to pay out. Do they have to pay out all their net income as dividends? As Absolutely not. They could pay out none. A lot of companies do, especially young companies, right? Because they're just reinvesting all that money into the firm. Which of the variables up here is, is related to our dividend policy? Oh, come on. Say again? Both. Both. In, in, in long, so long term, yes, but or the plowback ratio, the retention ratio, B, right? It's just one minus the dividend payout ratio. Does that make sense? And so the more dividends you pay, the less addition to retained earnings, the lower both of these growth rates are. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like your savings account balance. The less money you save, the slower the balance in your account will grow. Does that make sense? So if you're spending all your money as a company on dividends, then your assets won't grow as fast. If you're spending all your personal money on partying, then your savings account won't grow as fast. Does that make sense? Okay. And then finally, we have the financial policy, which is the capital structure of the firm. That's his equity multiplier, which is right here. That only affects SGR because it only affects ROE. And we said the more debt you had in your capital structure, the greater the distance between sustainable growth rate and internal growth rate is going to be. Okay, now just to make sure that we actually know what we're talking about here, Mr. Zach. Can you tell me what is the internal growth rate definition? No. Do you think we're in trouble? Yes. 
This guy's been paying attention the whole time. He doesn't know. What does that mean for you all? I saw some of you scratch your nose, so I know you weren't totally paying attention. Nobody does, by the way, 100%, right? Okay, let me try this again. Internal growth rate is the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm on internal equity alone. It's the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm on internal equity alone. The sustainable growth rate, or SGR, is the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm on internal equity and enough debt to keep the debt to equity ratio constant. It's the rate at which we can grow the firm's assets on internal equity and enough debt to keep the debt to equity ratio constant. 